beautiful humans. Welcome to another episode of Role Models, Juicy Conversations with Beautiful Humans. I'm Jennifer Norman, founder of the Human Beauty Movement and your host. This podcast thrives on your support. So if you like what you hear, follow us, rate us, review us, and share this episode with everyone you know across your networks. So I love giving the spotlight to those beautiful humans who are passionate about inclusivity, accessibility, and representation. Today, my guest is the lovely Shamaya Dewey, who's joining me from Hampshire, England. Shamaya is the CEO and founder of Shamaya Dewey Fashion, the UK's first clothing brand for people of short stature under four foot ten. She started the line in 2021 when she was only 22 years old as a student at the London College of Fashion. Now, Shamaya is a woman of average height, so she tends to get a lot of questions as to why she'd be interested in starting a fashion line for little people. So I'm glad she's here to share her story. Welcome, Shamaya. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It is my honor. So first of all, I like to start from the beginning. Please tell us about yourself and your family. Yeah, so I'm from England. I've always lived in England, in Hampshire specifically. I was raised in a home that wasn't necessarily very well off. So it meant that I grew up with lots of resilience, I think. And I think that's something that's really helped to push me forward. And I have come up against adversity in my childhood. So that means that as an adult again I have that resilience and that drive but I've always known I want to be a fashion designer since I was really really small and one of the things I used to do was make my brother watch me do fashion shows when I was younger because I loved it so much so yeah but otherwise had a pretty generic upbringing for someone in the UK but yeah it's definitely shaped who I am and where I've gone (laughs) now as I mentioned at the beginning your brand Shamaya Dewey Fashion is England's first ever collection created for people with dwarfism and those under four foot ten this is so exciting can you tell us what was the inspiration how did this come to be something that you thought gosh I'm going to start this kind of clothing line and it's going to be with my name on it and you know it's something that I really have a passion for yeah it's interesting because as I mentioned I've always wanted to be a fashion designer that's something that I just instinctively knew that that's what I wanted to do and I always knew I wanted to design to make people feel good and in particular women I wanted to make women feel confident in their bodies and to feel empowered in what they were and to have option but I wasn't quite sure how that would look until 2018 when working on a seasonal program that I do with young people one of the young people in my team had a chondroplasia which is the most common form of dwarfism and I got to spend a month with her kind of day to day got to see how she lives I got to see some of the challenges she faces and how resilient to those challenges she really was and really got to understand that the world really isn't built for someone under four foot ten and out of curiosity I did a little bit of research about fashion for little people and found that the only stuff on the market at the time was a bit frumpy it was quite expensive and it wasn't very trendy and I thought as a young person that's not what they're looking for like they want to feel exactly the same as everyone else it just needs to be smaller or it just needs to have shorter hems those kind of things it needs some small adaptions so I think instinctively at that moment in 2018 it was just before I went to university I knew that I wanted to explore that and then during my university studies I did do a couple of projects about clothing for people with dwarfism and in 2020 I started an enterprise placement year so I stayed on at London College of Fashion and to get onto this enterprise placement we had to have a business idea so my business idea was clothing for people with dwarfism and I was really fortunate I got to spend that year really learning the ins and outs of how to start a business the things you need to know regarding finances and IP and negotiating and all of those skills that really set me up so during my final year the clothing brand launched and it's been running since and I graduated in July and the past couple of months have been crazy busy but it's an exciting time. Now is the brand sold online or do you have placement in any stores in England? So it's all online at the moment but placement in stores is definitely a dream and it's definitely something that I want to do in terms of having pop-up shops as well and I love the way that Gymshark, if you know Gymshark, I love the way they've done it, where they get to go across the world, meet new people, they get to meet their community. And I think for something like what I do that is so community driven, wouldn't it be amazing if I could take that to every city and host a new park that's fully accessible and inclusive and is a real community driven space. So it's definitely a dream to have some more in-person spaces. Amazing. Now, I know that when you're getting into a specific niche, I mean, dwarfism is something that 
that is certainly prevalent, but I think that a lot of people within fashion would consider it too small to care about, unfortunately. And so unfortunately, this is a a part of the fashion industry that to your point hasn't been seen, it hasn't been represented, and you are the first in your country to be able to launch something like this because you did see that there is a need. And so why not serve it? Why not serve it with dignity? Why not serve it with style? And why not serve it so that people do find joy and acceptance and something that they feel good about? I can imagine that a lot of people probably had to take a lot of stuff to the tailor shop or just cut things and learn how to work with what was ever on the market and try their best to make it their own. Saw your experience with the person that was in your program originally? Yes. So her in particular, I can't quite remember if we actually ever spoke about clothing. I know that she was due to have her prom and I think we would have spoken about prom dresses more than likely. That's obviously a challenge because you have to cut half of the dress off pretty much. But it was really in the research that I did after that that I found the answers I was looking for. And like you said, lots of them work with local tailors and seamstresses or they have a mum or a grandma who tailors things for them, takes up the hems or they do a bit of DIY and they'll cut it, roll it. It's those kind of things, but that's really common. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a great option. I think like lots of people know, sending something to the tailor, it takes a lot of time. It can be quite expensive. Half the time it might come back and it's wrong. So then you've just spent maybe one and a half or two times the price of the garment and it's actually just been botched and you can't wear it anymore. So I'd like to think that we're a cheaper, faster, better way of wearing clothes that fit really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in putting together your business plan, you must have looked into the prevalence of dwarfism and, you know, some of the things that are in terms of trends for this particular market segment. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah. So the kind of market size of people with dwarfism is an interesting one because it's really hard to find solid numbers. And the numbers I've been working with for a long time is that there are 650,000 people worldwide who have dwarfism however it's actually dwarfism aware this month so there's lots more information out there flying around and I saw something recently posted that there's actually I think 1.4 million people Mm -hmm. with dwarfism which is a much larger number but I am now taking the business in a slightly different direction that while we include people with dwarfism we also include other conditions that are short stature so that's things like brittle bone disease that be cerebral palsy spina bifida those kind of conditions that mean that someone doesn't grow to average height and that is thought to be about 2.3% of the global population so that's about 200 million people worldwide who are short stature so it really is like a while it is a niche it's a pretty large market Mm -hmm. and the spending power is huge it's called the purple pound so if anyone's aware the spending power of people with disabilities is called the purple pound and in the UK alone it's something like 267 billion pounds per year Mm. so it really is a a huge market when you really get into the nitty gritty of it Mm. Impressive, impressive. So I saw that you offer fashion template books for little people and wheelchair users. And so it seems natural for you to take that next step and, you know, move into those that just need accessible clothing, frankly. Yeah, definitely. The fashion template books were inspired by conversations with people and speaking to people about fashion and what their challenges were and what they enjoyed about fashion that they want to lean more into when they have clothing that fits. A recurring story that I had from women especially was that when they were younger they wanted to be a model or a fashion designer or a stylist something in the fashion world but they just didn't see a place for it and they'd never seen anyone that looked like them before doing it so the fashion template books are there to to show them what clothing can look like on their body so they can test out different designs in there and it's also to inspire them they can be fashion designers they can be models they can do all of those things because there is we're spreading representation and positive portrayals of them but yeah it's been lovely to hear the feedback on those template books. Nice, nice. Has there been positive feedback on the clothing line as you've launched it? I understand that you've actually done a little bit of runway showing of your items. Can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we went to London Fashion Week in September. It was September the 17th. And I now say that was my, it was the best day of my life so far. It was so amazing. And I always think if I could just bottle up that feeling of joy that was shared between myself and the models and just spread it to every one. It was overwhelming. There were lots of tears, oh. lots of happy tears. But the feedback was great. I think not even coming from a biased point of view, I was told that when our models came out, the crowd cheered louder and they clapped harder. And someone described it as when my models came out, it felt as if they brought an energy with them. And that energy was 
just happiness and it just radiated from them I think the crowd felt that so and afterwards the crowd were coming up to the models asking for pictures and telling them how amazing they did and how lovely they looked and Mm -hmm. you can see on the models faces that this is one of the first times that they've really experienced that and feeling like they're Mm -hmm. the centre of attention and they're they're being respected and valued and seen and heard by the fashion industry was just amazing it was so lovely to sit back and watch something that I'd kind of been thinking about for so long and something I brought to life but when there's a a body in the clothes and someone's wearing it it really does bring it to life and Mm. it was so amazing oh well congratulations for putting that together as your brainchild and then seeing the joy and seeing the inspiration that is being spilled over to everybody now that it's become such a public event and it reminds me of the fact that I was listening to Oprah Winfrey talk the other day where she was saying that over the years and years and years that she has been doing her show and the thousands and thousands of interviews that she's done there is one thing that we all as a human race want and it's not power and it's not money it's not that it's validation we all want to be seen we all want to be heard we all want to be loved we all want to know that we matter and that is what you are bringing to people and when anybody disability or not dwarfism or not when they see somebody else being celebrated it touches the heart and it touches the soul and it really touches the emotions in a way that we all feel like a celebration is happening deservedly so because people who hadn't been seen hadn't been heard had been overlooked for so long are now finally seeing themselves in a place like London Fashion Week holy smoke and you were able to do that thank you thank you yeah yeah no that was completely the feedback the models gave was it was almost like a childhood dream that they never thought would be it it would come into fruition so it did feel amazing and I enjoyed giving that service and giving people that joy and being able to share it I also get joy from the happiness that they feel so it was amazing absolutely and so one of the other things that I just wanted to give you you know the hand clap for is your commitment to sustainability in fashion can you tell us a little bit about that and why that matters yeah so sustainability is something that is really instilled in us at London College of Fashion and it's something that I'm very passionate about I think I'm a intensely empathic person and if I know that there's an injustice somewhere I just can't turn a blind eye to it and at university we learn a lot about the garment trade and the atrocities that happen in places like China and Bangladesh and Pakistan these places that kind of fuel fast fashion so I knew that starting my own brand was always going to be in the most ethical way I could do it so I was really passionate about manufacturing in the UK because I think we have so much craftsmanship here why let it go to waste we used to have a booming sewing tradition and knitting and weaving and it's kind of slipped because everything's gone out to Asia because it's cheaper there because they can have sweatshops and slave trade and these awful things so I did some research did a couple of changes with manufacturers but have found a manufacturer in Newcastle in the UK that is founded by women and it's run by women who are all paid a living wage so that's where the clothing is made so it means I feel good about providing them with work and I feel good with the outcome I get and I feel like I hope the customers feel good that when they purchase from me it's coming from a loving place that it's all handmade and it feels very crafted rather than something you might get from Sheen that's come from a sweatshop in China Mm -hmm. and just run off the mill but I'm also very passionate about the fabrics that we use so obviously we all know that a lot of clothing is made out of polyester what people don't realise is that's made from like fossil fuels and plastics so that stuff doesn't biodegrade so at its end of life which in this day and age is pretty soon after it's bought it goes to landfill and it will sit there for however long it takes for it to degrade I'm not quite sure probably something stupid like 100 years but I'm really passionate about using biodegradable fabrics at least so bare minimum it could be made in cotton we've got some cotton bamboo jersey we've got some tensile which is made out of wood pulp and that means that when it does eventually go to landfill after hopefully years and years of wear it will degrade back into the earth and it will regenerate back into kind of natural soils so it's something that I'm really passionate about is the sustainability side but also making clothing ethically and appreciating the garment workers that actually bring it to life because without them there would be no fashion brands they are the ones that bring it to life yeah and a lot of people don't realize that when they're going to a shine or they're going to over here forever 21 or an h&m and you know there is a reason why that is so cheap and it should not be that cheap if you're using fair labor practices ethical labor practices and the fact that they are so cheap is an indicator it's almost a red flag should go off that you know there's probably some imbalance
balance in the way that this was made. Aside from the fact that, of course, when you get to a certain amount of economies of scale, you're growing and you're, you're doing things, you know, in very large place. Of course, you know, the cost of each good of each garment will go down, but to a certain degree. So I just want to say that after reviewing what you've got on your website and your pricing, it's really extraordinary for you to be able to do small batch sizes, having just started doing it fairly locally within the UK and being committed to the sustainability of the types of fabrics that you're using, the quality of the fabrics, the quality of the craftsmanship. It is not easy. It's not easy to start and be able to afford that at what a lot of people would consider accessible pricing. And now there's a whole loaded conversation about what is accessible pricing. But I know having been in business for a long time and looking at your pricing that it is incredibly fair. It is incredibly good value given all of the things that you're putting into in terms of the mindfulness of the way that you're running your business and you're starting it. So you're off to a great start, girl. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for the amount of representation that you're bringing to individuals who are under 410 who otherwise have had a really hard time being fashionable. <laughs> Yeah, a really hard time. I think as average height people, and I'm relatively short, I'm five foot two. So I've had my own very Me minor too. struggles. With <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure you can relate. Like, I have minor struggles with clothing that something might be slightly too long, an inch too long, or things don't quite fit over my hips and my waist the way I'd like them to. And sleeves might be a bit too long. I have minor struggles, but I don't think people quite realise the extent of the struggle that people have when they're under four foot ten. It's not just everything's too long is that the proportion is completely different and children's clothing doesn't fit because children's clothing is made for children it's mm -hmm. not made for adults with boobs and bums and thighs and and everything else and tummies it's not made for that and adult clothing is too long but it also is not quite the right proportion so there's a big challenge that I have which is just to get these proportions right there's no amount of googling I can do to find the answers it really is getting really hands-on talking to people trying things out. So it's a much longer process, but I think it's a much more valuable item at the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that I saw a TikTok that you actually made a, a model form, one of the first that would actually help to be able to measure out the garments that you're using, right? Yeah. So we've got a tailor's dummy in the form of a woman with a chondroplasia. So that's been like pivotal in helping to develop the garments in a way that fits perfectly, that when the customers put it on, it fits like a glove because it's designed literally for their bodies so like I was saying before just having a shorter hem or a shorter sleeve mm -hmm. doesn't quite fix all the issues they're still gaping at the back where they've got quite a curved back or they might have bigger thighs so even if something's shorter it might still be quite tight mm -hmm. so to be able to develop clothing on a mannequin that literally is that body type is something that I think even in the fashion industry alone it needs to be a bit more commonplace because as we all know if you look at a tailor's dummy and you look at the proportions of it it's nothing like a real woman as such there's no lumps and bumps or or there's just none of that the structure is completely wrong it's a really outdated way of designing so to have our short stature mannequin is pivotal and it means we can design things much more accurately wonderful do you have any of your favorite pieces with you that you can show us or so i don't because okay. they're all all rich but i can describe them for you yeah, and yeah. explain it so my favorite one which is probably i think the most well recognized one in our occasion my line is called the willow dress and it's made in a beautiful blue china design lace and there's quite an interesting story behind the lace so I met my dad when I was 18 and when I think I was maybe 21 we went to Scotland it was just before lockdown before we knew really what this whole lockdown was going to be we'd planned a trip to Scotland to go and visit some lace mills for a university project that I had so anyway we'd gone up to Scotland we went to this lace mill in the Irvine Valley called MYB Textiles and it's the last standing lace mill in Scotland of its kind and they're using like some of the oldest machines I think in the 1900s or 1800s and it's in this magical place they took us all the way around and they had some of this leftover blue lace fabric and I just loved it and I kept it for my final year project because I knew I wanted to do a final year project on Blue Willow China because I just love it I just think it's so nice I love the tradition behind it I think it's so beautiful 
people. I think it is one of those kind of quintessentially British things is to have the blue and white china. Mm. So interestingly, the Irvine Valley is where my Scottish half of the family is from, which is my dad's side. So it's quite nice that that dress has such a deep rooted story. The silhouette is quite similar to a Dior dress and Dior's like my biggest influence and I absolutely love his designs and he was probably the person that I was most inspired by as a kid when I watched a documentary about him so the willow dress is definitely very special to me and it's definitely the most favorite thing I've designed so far and I think from speaking to other people everyone's blown away by that dress so I think that's definitely got to be the best my most favorite oh how lovely do you have any other fashion influences aside from Christian Dior I do I find lots of designers very influential I love the story and the meaning by a lot of what Alexander McQueen did and I do love his silhouettes as well and the kind of the grungy feel which is something that his clothing is probably something that I would never really wear but I'm really inspired by that I'm always very inspired by the stories behind his collections I just love that there was so much advocacy behind them and he was really passionate about the things he believed in and I'm also very inspired by Stella McCartney and her sustainability views and I, and I don't know if she's vegan or vegetarian but I'm vegan so I very much relate to that so I'd say they're probably my two other biggest inspirations lovely I actually had the opportunity to go see an exhibit of Alexander McQueen's fashion at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art recently where they paired his work along with masterpieces and headdresses and incredibly artful shoes it was just a stunning Mm. statement about his work his legacy and where he got his inspiration in some cases from Greek goddesses and other cases it was very to your point grungy and very Mm. you know God save the queen (laughs) and just really extraordinary extraordinary work that definitely had an impact and influence on a lot of fashion for sure I think his legacy is so interesting and if you watch the documentary on Netflix about him it's so tragic and it is so sad Mm. but it's so fascinating at the same time so I'm always just very inspired by anything that comes out of Alexander McQueen and I love that his legacy is still going and it's very much still going strong Mm. so where do you see yourself and Shamaya Dewey Fashion going in five years so I think in five years I imagine the brand being like a one-stop shop for short stature people and I imagine that we'll be doing much larger collections and more frequent collections while sticking to our ethical and sustainability values I do really want to be that place that for anyone under four foot ten whether you're just proportional and you just happen to be very small or whether you have dwarfism or brittle bone or cerebral palsy or down syndrome all of these conditions that make someone under four foot ten I want to be the place that people recognize as the place to go so I know there's a place called is it long tall Sally I think for tall people Mm. which I think maybe is possibly outdated now but that kind of place that people recognize oh when you're short you go to Shmidri fashion and I'm really passionate about keeping it exclusive to small people because average height people we've got loads of options as someone who's five foot two there's lots of petite ranges I can shop from that cater to some of my height Mm -hmm. and there are collections for tall people there are now plus size collections there are brands that cater to people who are ethnically diverse and I just think that short stature people are the most ignored group of people Mm. in the world that's my personal belief so I see it really being the one-stop shop I see myself doing a lot more public speaking about clothing for short stature people and accessible design because it's something I'm so passionate about and I've learned so much about and I want to share that and I want to teach students because I think students are the the way forward is teaching the people in education really that accessibility is something that needs to be spoken about and it's something that needs to be recognized and that's across things like fashion design art architecture product design all of these things that affect our day-to-day lives I think there needs to be a lot more education so I really do want to speak about that and to be part of that change but I just see the brand continuing to grow and to reach more and more people and to impact people in a really positive way so that's how I see myself in five years wonderful now you know at a young age you took that leap of faith in yourself in what your vision was for this you started this fashion line do you have any words of advice for those that might be a bit intimidated to begin or you know just really want to make a difference but don't really know how yeah so I think I'm definitely one of those people that knew I wanted to make a difference in the world and I think that's just part of my personality that's part of my being that I knew I wanted to do something that was going to be impactful in a really nice way 
way that wasn't part of the competitive and vain part of fashion I think I would encourage people to just get out there and to speak to people because I don't think it will take long before you find a group of people or an, an issue that's been ignored like myself working with this girl with a contraplasia it's something that I was never exposed to before so it was never on my radar had I not have met her I probably wouldn't be where I am now so it's just a case of I think meeting people speaking to people and just being very present and mindful of what's going on around you because there are things that could change everywhere and there are places there's room for all of us to make a difference and one of the amazing things about the adaptive fashion industry is that we're so welcoming and that we're so friendly we're all friends of each other in the UK all of us adaptive brands we all help each other out with different information or different opportunities so I think if you're thinking about going into the adaptive fashion world do it because you'll be welcomed with open arms and I think you have just got to have that resilience like I mentioned before I think having a background of adversity and growing up with not very much money and I moved out when I was 17 so I've been self-sufficient for a long time I've grown that resilience and it's something that is now instilled in me so when I come up against challenges and hurdles I don't see it as an end point I just see it as just another challenge Mm -hmm. so encouraging people to have that resilience and just to go for it you kind of have to just start if you don't start now maybe you never will so just start and I think it's the Stephen Bartlett cast star of a CEO I'm sure it's him that says just to get one percent better every day (laughs) and I love that because on the days where you really don't feel like it or things are really tough and you're having a really bad day really tired if you just think if I just get one percent better today then I'm on the right track and that could be one percent better could be having a day off sometimes that's having a day off or one percent better could be do you know what I'm gonna make my comfort food tonight and I'm gonna have pizza instead of my usual healthy mindful dinner I think keeping that in mind when you're trying to start something new just get one percent better whether that's just setting up a new email for your new business or having a look at how much websites cost or whatever it might be I think that's a nice way to start oh well thank you so much for those words of advice Shamaya Dewey I appreciate you coming onto the show you are a role model and I am so excited to see what Shamaya Dewey fashion has in store for it going into the future thank you Thank you.